By way of a change, today I'm going to be using the King James Version. I am the light of the world. John chapter 8 verses 12 to 30. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came, and whither I go. But ye cannot tell whence I come, and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law, that the testimony of two men is true. I am the one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should also have known my father. These words spake Jesus in the treasury, as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he saith, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. And I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. And if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. Jesus said unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Heavenly Father, my prayer in the name of Jesus this afternoon is that as I teach and explain the Lord Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. Father, that your name will be glorified. And importantly too, Father, that your kingdom will somehow be extended as I proclaim these words. Father, thank you that I am able once again to broadcast this ministry and this message. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. In order for me to adequately explain what Jesus meant when he said, I am the light of the world. We need to have a look at the context of this uh, chapter 8 of John. And the context is very clearly the Feast of the Tabernacles. Now the Feast of the Tabernacles was one of those feasts, one of three feasts, which was known as a pilgrimage feast, that the Jewish people were required to go to Jerusalem. It was also known as the Feast of Tabernacles or the Sukkot. It was also known as the Feast of the Ingathering. And I'll explain that to you in a moment or two. So let's examine some of the important emphases of this particular feast. First of all, Jewish people had to live in Sukkot or tabernacles or booths and this was to remind them of the 40 years that they spent in the wilderness surrounding the tabernacle living in tents and booths and this was to remind them of those difficult times in the wilderness and if you go to Jerusalem now and just as a matter of interest you will find that Christians throughout the world have adopted the Feast of Tabernacles as one of their own 
And many, many pilgrims, when they can, will go to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. And one of the aspects of this belief in the Feast of Tabernacles is that they believe that Jesus will come again during the Feast of Tabernacles. That's a discussion for another time. Talking about booths, if you go to Jerusalem today during the Feast of, of Tabernacles, you will find Jewish people building booths or little tents on their apartment verandas so that they can keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It was a seven-day feast and there was an eighth day. And it is the eighth day which we're going to be looking at this afternoon and examining a little bit more closely because of what Jesus did on that particular day. But before we do that, let me go on a little bit further and explain some of the other interesting aspects of the Feast of Tabernacles. The second thing that they were required to do, because it was a harvest festival, by the way, they gave thanks for the harvest, and on the eighth day, they actually had a special prayer for rain for the following harvest. Now, to remind them of God's creative goodness to them as the Jewish people, they were required to wave palm branches. Attached to the palm branches were willow tree branches and leafy tree branches, and they were also able to carry citrus fruit of some kind. This was God's provision for them. Then another very, very important aspect was what we're going to be looking at in some depth this afternoon. Just recently, I think it was around about 2004, the archaeologists in Jerusalem discovered what they now believe to be the Pool of Siloam. They were doing an archaeological dig in Jerusalem, in the city of David, and they came across the Pool of Siloam, which in some way is connected to Hezekiah's tunnel. Now you will remember that it was at the Pool of Siloam that Jesus, after he had healed the blind man, said, go and wash in the Pool of Siloam. Now why is that important for the Feast of Tabernacles? There was a very, very special ceremony which took place east each evening during the Feast of Tabernacles for the first seven evenings. What would happen is that one of the priests carrying a golden pitcher would go from the temple where the altar was all the way down to the Pool of Siloam where he would fill this golden pitcher with life-giving water. And he would be followed with Jews praising God and singing psalms. So there is one more aspect of the Feast of Tabernacles which I need to bring to your attention. And that is this. Every night, some of the helpers would put up four massive candelabras, gold candelabras. They say 75 feet each high. That's about 30 meters each. And they made so much light that you could see Jerusalem from kilometers outside of the city. The temple courtyard would have been bathed in light. And that's the symbol that I want to pick up on now, because it is the symbol of those lights which the Messiah was to bring to the Jewish people, the light of the world, that Jesus made the comment I am the light of the world. And there is another very important little detail which we must not miss. In the last verse of chapter 7 of John, and the first two verses of chapter 8, it reads like this. Then they all went home. This is now after the Feast of Tabernacles. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now we know that Jesus often went to the Mount of Olives to pray and to spend time with his Father. 
And it says, at dawn, he appeared in the temple court again. And it goes on in the first section of chapter 8 of John, talking about that woman that was caught in adultery. And the men were wanting to stone her. And you will remember that Jesus said to those men, Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And they looked at him and they all went away sad because they knew they were sinful human beings. And Jesus, without condemning the woman, said to her, Your sins are forgiven. That would have freaked them out as well because nobody but God can forgive sins. He forgives the woman's sins and he says to her, Go and sin no more. And immediately after that, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And as we saw in the story about the bread of life, the Father draws us to Jesus and gives us the grace to believe in him. And here we find Jesus not only providing the light, but also giving us the eyes to see the light. He gives us the light and we give others the light. It reminds me of that little cliche we often use in Christian circles. Come into the light, sister. Or have you found the light, brother? Now the problem with what I'm seeing in this passage is that here we have the great I am. Yahweh himself claiming to be the light of the world. And yet there are billions of people all over the world who will not accept that Jesus is the light of the world. They choose to stay in darkness and to live evil and diabolical lives. I wonder what is the reason behind that. I think that there could be two possible reasons. The first one is ignorance and the second one is pride. Ignorance about what? Ignorance of the truth. And you know, the problem for me is that many of the people who to this day are ignorant of the truth. And we've had nearly 2,000 years since Jesus was crucified and since he was resurrected. To this day, men and women who have grown up in so-called Christian homes, men and women who have been to so-called Christian schools, who have heard the gospel, still to this day refuse through their own pride and their ignorance to accept that Jesus is the light of the world. How many times have you heard, particularly men say, you know what, I don't come to church anymore. I had to go to chapel so often when I was at school, I'm chapeled out now. Well, I'm churched out. That kind of arrogance and ignorance could in the end cost. Unfortunately, many are indifferent and ignorant about the true gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of a young man who was one of the ordinance at college when I was there. He eventually became the chaplain to the ANC in exile in Zambia. And this is what he had to say about the second coming of our Lord Jesus. He said, if the Lord Jesus came back tomorrow, he would come back with an AK-47 in his hand. You see, that kind of ignorance, arrogance. What about some of the novels that have been going around for the last decades about the life of Jesus. Novels which show that Jesus, in fact, was not the perfect, sinless Savior of the world. This condemnation of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the priests, whom he called blind guides, the ones who were supposed to be representing God to the people, Jesus called blind guides. That same condemnation 
could well be measured against many, many of us who believe that we are Christians. How many times I've heard particularly farmers say to me, Dennis, you know what? I don't have to read my Bible. I don't have to come to church. I just go and sit on the hill above my house on the farm and I'm closer to God than I can ever be in one of your churches. I definitely believe in God. But I don't have to read the Bible or worship Him in church. I came across this quotation from the late Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a Baptist pastor. He wrote this, Their God is something which they created themselves, a being who is always prepared to oblige and excuse them. They do not worship Him with awe and respect. Indeed, they do not worship Him at all. They reveal that their so-called God is no God at all in their talk. For they are forever saying that they are simply cannot able to believe that God will punish the unrepentant sinner to all eternity. And this and that. They cannot believe that God will do so. Therefore they draw the conclusion that God does not and will not. In other words, God does what they believe he ought to do or not do. What a false and blasphemous conception of God. How utterly untrue and unworthy. Such, says Martin Lloyd-Jones, is the new paganism of today. Verse 19 of that passage says, Then they asked him, Where is your father? And Jesus replied, You do not know me or my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. And let me just say this, we cannot claim to know the Father if we do not know Jesus. Jesus is the way to the Father. I'm reminded once again of that little saying which goes like this, No Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. I'm going to put that up on the slide so that you will see exactly what I'm talking about. So far, all you've heard this afternoon has been negative regarding the response of the Pharisees and many known to us. But I must end on a positive note. Verse 30 says this, just a little passage in the middle of in nowhere. Verse 30 says, even as he spoke, many believed in him. I have often prayed, O oh Lord, as I speak, let people believe in you. I don't know whether people believe in Jesus as I gossip the gospel. I pray that they do. But that's not what is important. The important thing is for you and for me is that we need to continue gossiping the gospel. Keep sharing our testimonies in the good seasons and in the bad because the harvest is ripe. And if ever there was a time for a harvest in South Africa and indeed in the world, that time is now. So ultimately what made the difference to those people as they heard Jesus talking about himself as being the light of the world? Verse 28 says this, So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. What did Jesus mean when He said, When you lift me up, you will know that I am He? That was the crucifixion. And I think the centurion in Luke chapter 23 and verse 47 says it in a way which is the best. He says, seeing what happened, he praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. Father, I pray that more and more people will come to know our Lord Jesus 
as a righteous, sinless Savior. I pray that they will come to know our Lord Jesus as the one who was tempted in every way that we are, but knew no sin. And I pray that they will come to know him as their personal Savior and Lord. Thank you, my Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.